everyone. Good to see everyone back in the assembly tonight on this beautiful uh, Wednesday night. Let's everyone get a hymn book, turn to number 553, 553, sweet by and by. Let's sing the first and the last verses together. Turn and hold number 342. That'll be our invitation hymn tonight. <clears throat> Before Mike uh, gets up and takes care of the prayer list, I just wanted to uh, give an update on a couple individuals that we've been uh, checking on and working with. Uh, so, uh, And then you'll have the opportunity to update and add anything uh, when Mike gets up here. I spoke with Betty Dales today. Um, she will be leaving uh, for home tomorrow. She's been in Abington Health and Rehab, and uh, the doctors and therapists are pleased with her rehabilitation and where she's going with that. And so uh, she's really excited about going back home, uh, and they said they may possibility to have more rehab at home, but she's doing really well. And she wanted me to uh, share with everyone our appreciation of the prayers that uh, we've been sending up. And then <clears throat> Bill and Pauline Stacy, uh, they are both also at Abington Health and Rehab. And I did see the address up front um, that's posted on some addresses we have. If you would like to uh, send Bill and Pauline Stacy. Um, uh, just a note, uh, a card or anything like that. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. But they're at the uh, rehab as well. And remember um, those two individuals. And uh, I talked to Bill today that they're going to have to release him from our He still can't walk. And he's hoping that they can get him in the VA hospital to help him walk before Pauline gets to come home. If not, they don't know what they're going to do. Mm, okay. Sounds a little bit tough. All righty. When's your doctor's appointment rescheduled, Tasha? August 
Okay. We'll be praying for you. All right, Brother Mike is going to come up and take care of the rest, okay? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Bo Christian, Sue Christian, Nala Coleman, Ring Colley, Frank Colley, Barbara Compton, Earl Compton, Wanda Jo Cooper, Betty Dales, Janet Day, Irene Deal, Percy Deal, Ronald Deal, Caroline Dotson, Gay and David Harden, Hobart and Kathy Kennedy, Irene Lee, Joanne Lee, Ethel Morgan, Edith Owens, May Ratliff, Helen Stacy, William Stacy, Judy Street, Dennis and Clarice, Betty and Charlie, Troy Vires, June Yates, and Meredith Zoar. Need to add anyone? Donald? Yeah, I'm just afraid that they do. They'll be sorry. Man, Daddy's The 19th. The 19th and still the 17th. Okay. Uh, Betty Castle, Eddie Dales, William Davis, Irene Dawson, Raymond Dawson, Darrell Deal, Caroline Dillo, Matt Dotson, Gene Duty. Dan Fuller, Juanita Hale, Lita Hale, Tammy Heish, and her surgery is July the 19th instead of the 17th. Robert Hibbets, Margie Jude, Liz Justice, Bobby Justice, Leanne Lester, Kurt and Elaine Osborne, Jackson Purry, Landon Sykes, Bill and Pauline Stacy, Shirley Stacy, Geraldine Stacy, Tasha's, your appointment's when, Tasha? Uh, Verna Valentine and Anthony West. Okay. On the twentieth? Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. On the twentieth, we've got four people that are here are going to have either surgery or aggressive procedures. On the twentieth. Okay. On our special needs, we got the church, the lost, the nation, our military personnel first responders, and the school teachers. On our cancer list, got Dan Brankenshire, Ray Blankenship, Ernie Blankenship, Lucas Boyd, Zach Carter, James Carver, Bobby Church, Ridge Coleman, Vicki Colley, Jim Cook, Henry Dobson, Danny Dobson, Travis Eastep, who? Jim Cook passed away? Yeah. Is that the one that lives up? It was in Buckhannon Supply. Yeah. Travis Eastep, Marina Fletcher, Billy Hall, Stephanie Hay, Phyllis Johnson, Tiffany Kimball, Jerry Matney, 
Christine McCoy, Rick Mullins, Ben Ratliff, Mary Reif, Jean and Pam Reif, Harold Shortridge, Eileen Shortridge, Lisa Skeens, Mildred Skeens, Barney Stiltner, Steve Stiltner, Kathy Sykes, Glenda Tackett, Loretta Vires, Don Wallace, Mark Webb, and Kevin Welch. Anyone for the cancer list? Okay, well, that's good. Now, who was that? Henry. Henry Dobson. Phyllis Matney. Anyone else? Did you mention June Yates on the husband? Yeah, I did. She doing okay? She's doing good. Empty expressions. I got the family of Clyde Hibbets. Okay, if there's no one else, Rodney, could we get you to open in prayer? And after everyone's prayed that one, two, Roger, would you close?
right for our nation. Uh, we just pray that our leaders, the ones that are in charge, that they can turn to you for the answers that they're looking for. Father, help them to understand that we need to trust in you more than anything. Oh, it's so wonderful that every time we get an opportunity to be with your people in the assembly. Father, I just first thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ here at Grundy. Thank you that we can laugh, have fun, learn as much about you we possibly can. As Roddy said in his prayer, Father, thank you. I pray for our young people. I pray for our upcoming vacation Bible school that begins this Sunday. Many young people will come and we'll teach them the Word of God and help them learn more about you Father, I pray for these that we have mentioned tonight. We continue to lift up Dennis and Claire's to your throne. We thank you, dear God, for the healing that has been just marvelous. Father, we just ask for it to continue, Father. And Father, I again lift up 
Dan Fuller to your throne and ask your strength, your healing for him. Oh, Father, and there are so many more that are facing surgeries, facing tests. But Father, the greatest need in their life, if they're not a Christian, is they give their life to you and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for opportunities that we can share the gospel and be that light to a world that is lost. Be with Brandon as he breaks the bread of life to us tonight, Father. May we learn from thy precious word. Apply it to our lives, but then most importantly, take it out into this world and share this message with others. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, we certainly thank you for the many, many blessings that has been ours this day and just the privilege and the opportunity to uh, gather together on this beautiful, beautiful evening. <coughs> we certainly, Heavenly Father, uh, has already been prayed. We, we do want to remember our little sister, Clarice. Uh, if, uh, what preacher tells me, she's got about three months with a back brace, and uh, we just pray that she can continue to heal, and we certainly thank you, Heavenly Father, for the fact that she seems to be... Uh, getting stronger each day, and we pray that will continue. And, uh, we know, Heavenly Father, uh, <clears throat> there are uh, uh, a few sitting here with us tonight in Psalms that are not uh, extremely well, and you know each one of them, and, and we just ask your uh, blessings on each one of those. Uh, and Heavenly Father, we mentioned uh, just a couple on the, the prayer list, on the cancer list. Uh, Henry Dobson, we've had him on this list for a long, long time, and uh, uh, and then a new name we added, Phyllis Matt. We just pray your blessings on both of those, Heavenly Father, and uh, Nyla Coleman. We certainly want to remember her <clears throat> in the condition she's in, and and help us always, Heavenly Father, remember Ethel Morgan, uh, all she <clears throat> means to us, and all the work that she has done here for just decade after decade after decade. We certainly. Pray that things would go well with her. And uh, we want to remember Tracy's father up in Ohio. And uh, as she's concerned with her dad, Richard has a daily uh, struggle with his mother, Heavenly Father, and just both of them. Uh, we just pray, Heavenly Father, for Tracy and Richard as they take care of their parents. And it's certainly a privilege to be able to try to take care and comfort the parents, uh, Heavenly Father. And we want to remember the children up at the camp this week and just pray, Heavenly Father, uh, your blessings upon them. They can have a good, uh, productive week. And we know, Heavenly Father, next week our VBS, uh, a lot of kids are excited about that. And we certainly ask your blessings to be up on them. them. And we certainly thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, all of those <coughs> that work and participate uh, in that. And uh, without mentioning the names, Heavenly Father, and I think we have about Four people uh, that are having either surgery or procedures on the 20th next week. And uh, we just ask your blessings upon uh, each one of those cases that you would bless them, Heavenly Father, with a, uh, a successful event. And, uh, and just now, Heavenly Father, we uh, ask you to bless Brandon as he shares with us our study tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Well, good evening. Good evening. I'm glad to be here and continue our study this week in our new series we began last week with Misquoted. And uh, kind of the purpose of this study and my intentions is talking about common church cliches and out of context scripture that is often used behind the pulpits in the pews in our conversations and uh, really ask the question is that really a biblical saying and oftentimes we quote scripture and I, I don't think a lot of times uh, we understand what that scripture is we just put it in uh, 
the context of that time or situation. Um, and I asked the question in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, whether or not we really believed those verses. Everybody said yes. And most of us are familiar with a movement that is associated with the Church of Christ that began in the 1800s, the Restoration Movement. And their whole movement, the whole purpose of that movement was to get back to the Bible. To say things by Bible ways, do things by Bible ways. Kind of get the gist, we know that. But here's the thing, if, if we're going to associate ourselves doing things Bible ways, saying things Bible ways, then we got to accurately interpret the Scripture. We've got to understand the scripture. We've got to understand the text. And so that's kind of what I want us to do. We've got to get in that mindset. And I, I pray that you have your Bibles. I'm, I'm, we're going to have it on the screen, but it's good to have your Bibles. It's going to help you with the study. You've got to be familiar with the Word and your Bible and, uh, so you can look at the scripture. Um, but we're going to, tonight in our part two, uh, this is a very... A quoted scripture, a very common um, saying. Um, a lot of people c cannot tell you where that scripture is. Some people may know it, but we're gonna, I'm going to mention this scripture. I'm going to talk about it, and then we're going to look at the context. And so our Bible study is going to be in the context of this misquoted scripture. Now, how many has ever heard? Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be with you also. Probably everybody. And a lot of us say that, right? Um, and so when that is being quoted, what is assumed? Why, why is that quoted oftentimes? Okay, prayer. That's, it is associated with prayer. Right, yeah. Excuses not being in the assembly. Okay, that, there is that too, yeah. You guys, you guys know a little bit there, doing good. And it's also associated when there's a low number that's assembling together where we have big expectations like a revival. I've heard it at revival meetings, I couldn't tell you how much. And, and the number, the attendance isn't is as expected. You'll hear the preacher say we're two or three gathered. You know, we don't, we don't have... A lot of people here, but the Bible says we're two or three. You've heard that like that before. So everybody's right in how that's used. It's used in all these different ways. But um, when, when that's being said, and we take it as that, what, what's really? Be, how can we take that? Like it's say a low attendance, a low attendance service, and someone says we're two or three gathered in my name. What's being implied in those quotations? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Right. Does that make sense? That it, it, is God with us, with the Lord with us when we're by ourselves? Amen. Yeah. Is He with us when we're in a prayer closet? Amen. And so, I mean, a lot of people, you know, use justification in different situations. But uh, before we get in the context, other than Anthony, that I know for sure knows where this is at, does anybody else know where this is at? Yeah. I, a lot of people misquote it, and you hear it all the time, but do you know where it's at in the Bible? Okay, I assume that you don't, and that's okay. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. That's where the verse is found. It is a correct quotation of the verse, but it's quotated, it's misquoted out of context. And so... We're, we know why it's misquoted and, and the ways that it's implied and it's misquoted, but we've got to look at the context. Context is what? I said it last week. It's key. Context is key. 
And so if, if we make the claim we're going to do things by Bible ways, say things by Bible things, it all, always begins in the context of the Scripture. Why, why is Jesus saying what he says in verse 20? So let's talk about that here. And, and we're going to look at the context and so, you know, you guys answered about attendance, about praying, um, you know, a lot of different things. But remember always, context is important. And uh, here's the thing. When we quote a scripture out of context, out of its intended purpose that God has it in the Bible, what is being reproduced? If we take a scripture out of context and in the way that God hasn't, that it's not in the Bible... What's going to be reproduced? You're adding to it. Yeah. What else? Confusion. Yeah. And you guys are definitely right. And because of that, that causes a false idea, a false teaching. And so we've got to look at these false misquoted scripture and try to clean that up. And it's all about a mindset. We've got to get in the proper mindset, okay? So let's look at context. Now, Jesus, he, every time we know the Jewish crowd, that's his audience in Matthew 18. And Jew, uh, Jesus often talked a lot about the Jewish laws and the culture. That's very common of the time. And uh, he, he related the laws, the culture, and his teachings and how it's going to better reflect the kingdom of God. And so in Matthew 18... We see he's doing this again, and he's referring to an important part of the law. Okay, verse 20 comes from the law, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. But he's referring to a part of the law about discipline amongst the congregation, church discipline. Okay, and we're going to talk about church discipline, but look at it in the biblical sense. Now, let's begin in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 18. The Bible says... Moreover, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So, first of all, it's understand historical context here. The Jews are going to understand the terminology of a tax collector and a Gentile or a sinner. They're going to understand that. But let's go to verse 15. Now, pretty much all translations have, beginning in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against thee, King James, New King James, against you. Now, in the original manuscripts in the Greek language, that against you, against thee, is not in there. That was added by the Latin, by the Latin church, by the Catholics. But now, if that was to be true, okay, let's look at it here in verse 15. We're going to, break, we're going to have an expository lesson. If, if this was true, moreover, if your sin, brother sins against you, um, then... Does it matter if anybody else sins as long as it's not against me? Like, like if I read it and say if, it sin, if they're sinning against me, then I know I need to fix the problem. We can take it like that. But when we look at the original manuscript, that against you or against thee, that's not in there. If your brother sins, if we have a brother and sister who, who needs help, who's in sin, and they need to be led out, they need to be fixed, who's the responsibility on them? All Christians. It's all Christians, right? And so instead of like, well, Greg has did something to hurt Anthony. And, and if I read that verse, moreover, if a brother trespasses passes against thee or against you, well, I can say, well, Greg didn't do nothing to me. He did it to Anthony. It ain't none of my business. Right? But I, so we've got to look. Does that make sense? Take, and, and what I've done... Maybe some of you feel that it's sacrilegious, but I put a big X on that against you. Just because I know in the original Greek, and I've went back and me and Anthony studied a little bit, it do, it's not in there. So if we know that we have a brother or sister who's in sin, we need to approach them privately and help them. 
Not go ahead and cast them in the fire of hell and, and go ahead and say, well, they're, they're going to die and go. Just leave them alone. But now, does that make sense? Any questions about that? Now, in our reading that Jesus is teaches, he teaches that an individual is really given four chances to make amends. Four chances to fix the problem. Now, you think about that. That's far more opportunities than a lot of us would give people. Right? It'd only take one time for some of us, and we wouldn't have nothing else to do with an individual. But he's referring to an important part of the law here, and this is protocol. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. To follow when we have a problem with an individual, our brother or sister in the church. Now, verse 15, the reference to your brother, it refers to the conduct of the community of believers. And so, who's the crowd that he's talking to again? Is he talking to Americans? Is he talking to Germans? Who's he talking to? He's talking to Jews. They're not Christian. There are no Christians during this time. There's only Jews. Matthew was written to the Jews. And so when he says to your brother, well, the Jews are going to understand that because the Jews lived in a community amongst each other. They were all in the synagogue. They had communities. And so your brother is referring to the fellow Jew. And so kind of understand that. That word you is singular. We know kind of the tenses. And so the, here's the point. The disciple is not to ignore the fault of another disciple, but we are to rather confront in love. To confront them in love and it, with the hope that they repent. It's all about reconciliation and repentance here in context. In, in verse 15, according to verse 15, if, there's a, if, if we have a brother or sister who we know is in sin, how are we to approach that? Are we to go gossip and call the neighbor and spread it? We're go, we are, according to verse 15, we are to go alone and try to reconcile. It's a private confrontation. It's essential that we go to an offending brother first. Now, if someone's involved in an open, public, serious sin, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 is the model in unison with Matthew 18, 15. 1 Corinthians models the final phrase of dis, disfellowship. You ever heard the word disfellowship? You, you, you disfellowship someone, you disfellowship, disfellowship or brother or sister in Christ. Is that practice today? Let's be honest. Yeah, denominations do. Yeah, they do. But in, in, in the churches of Christ, let's be honest, it's not practice. And... And let me give you a, a story. It's been probably within the past two years. This is a true story. I'm not going to name any names. or any, I didn't even know the individuals. I just kept up with the, the congregation. There was a church in Tennessee there a couple years ago. And it didn't make public until the individual made it public. But the situation was there was this individual who had been in that congregation their whole life. And... Um, but it came, the elders came to find out that this individual was committing sexual immorality. They were in sin. And so the elders, they scheduled meetings one-on-one -on -one with the individual. Um, they reached by phone call. They sent letters. They tried to reach out to this individual to talk about the issue, to fix the issue. Nobody, the congregation didn't even know that it was a private thing that was going on at this time. And so this is how it was made public. The elders gave it one last chance. They sent a letter home to this individual in the congregation. Um, and the letter read, read, me paraphrasing, we've reached out to you many times to try to reconcile and fix the issue. Uh, you've ignored it. Uh, we now, the congregation at so-and-so Church of Christ, we disfellowship you. Because you remain in sin, you haven't repented. Well, this individual, they take a picture of this letter, and then guess what they do? It's on social media. And it's plastered all over social media. You have the, the names of the elders. You have the name of the congregation. 
And when something like that's on social media, guess what happens? It's, it becomes a mess. And it, may, and it makes the congregation looks bad. It makes the elders look bad. It makes, uh, you know, the Christian faith looks bad. But the thing is, um, you know, this individual didn't repent, didn't want to repent, and uh, caused a scene out of it that could have been fixed. But they remained in their sin. Now, here's the thing. We are to convince an individual of their sin. If someone's in sin, and we know that it's wrong, in private, we are to convince them that they are in sin and help them reconcile. Now, here's the thing. I have never, ever enjoyed trying to reconcile an issue. And I, don't, I think you know, the elders here have dealt with some private issues, and I'm sure that they can say this. It's not an enjoyable thing when you have someone who is in sin and you're trying to fix it. If you enjoy that, if that gets you excited to go confront someone with a problem, then you need to work on some humility. Um, it, it's, not, it's not fun. Um, but when church discipline is practice, to be, we might as well be prepared to be misunderstood. We're going to be called bigots, hypocrites, hateful, mean. When church discipline is practiced, when the Bible is practiced the way that it is meant to be, be prepared to be attacked because it's going to come. And so, but the whole goal, the whole goal of reconciliation. Now, we're talking about the context, or word two or three are gathering in my name. I'm not going to jump to that verse if we don't talk about context. The whole context, the whole point in our misunderstanding of, uh, uh, concerning the world is our whole goal is to restore our brothers, brother or sister back to the faith. It's not to go ahead and condemn them to hell and throw them out and give up on them. The whole point is, in our preaching, in our teaching, in our stance on the gospel... It's to restore and re reconcile a relationship back to the Lord and back to the church. Amen. Any questions so far about anything? It makes more sense when we go verse by verse and look at the historical context. When we get down to verse 20, all this will make so much more sense. And then I hope, those of us who are here and those that are listening, when you hear that misquoted verse, that this lesson is going to come to mind and say, that may not be right, how that is being quoted. Look at verse 16. Jesus said, But if he will not hear, take with you two, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And so if they don't, pretty simple, if they don't listen to you the first time one-on-one, -on -one, take someone else with you, one or two people, to help check uh, how valid the, the issue is. And that makes things easier that way. Any question? That's pretty simple. Does, does anybody have a hard time understanding that? Is there a better way that I can explain that? If you're trying to confront a sin or an issue, do it one-on-one. -on -one. Fix the problem in private. If that doesn't work, take one or two witnesses with you to, to try to talk it and help, help reconcile. Does that make sense? But, but oftentimes, um, and it's not, we see it more in younger people, but it's not just younger people, it's with the inexperienced. That's the way we need to look at it. People who are inexperienced with the word or with how to deal with confrontation What's the first thing that we see we, the inexperienced wants to do? They want to go ahead and give up on them, don't they? They want to go ahead and plaster them. It, I, I, I'm, I'll admit, I was like that. I'm not going to lie. I was like that. I'm just inexperienced with, with how to deal with confrontation and issues. But when we look at the Bible and understand how, how to deal with reconciliation and restoring a relationship, um, we see that it takes some work. It takes some patience. It takes you know, helping the individual. Verse 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church, tell it to the community. And the, the Jews would have been familiar with that word congregation. They would have brought it for the community. Go ahead, Brother Jim. Uh, when you started out, you called me, this, you know, this is before the church. 
Uh huh. It's, uh, this is uh, more, I guess, related to the synagogue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That word "church" that we have in our English translation, they would have known it as the synagogue or the community. Yeah. And, and what? And, and you know, that's a good thought. I'll kind of bring that up. Because that's where you would always bring an issue. You would go before the synagogue and the religious leaders and the rabbi would take care of it. This is referred to as uh, church discipline. Right. That's, that's what it's referred to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and church, church, congregation, community, synagogue, it, it, it all means the same. It's the same exact word. Church, community, synagogue, uh, those are the same words. The English translation, they just put church. But, yeah. But, you know, and we'll talk more in these series. We, we as Americans, what do we do to the Bible? We put an American mindset on it, don't we? That's what we do. And we'll talk more about that in other, um, other studies. But we've got to be careful with them. I, I know a lot of us, many of us have grown up in the church in America and and seen things done, and, and there's nothing wrong with traditions. I'm not trying to say that, but what I'm trying, you know, we need to be careful with preconceived ideas and how we approach the scriptures. And, uh, yes. Okay, go ahead. The uh, statement you made for church discipline is, uh, I'm going to give you a good example. Practice okay. Anymore. The example that you gave us about happened in Tennessee. Uh huh. I know it happened in Grundy. Yeah. And these folks don't know who it is because it was kept quiet. It wasn't put in a letter. Right. And that's all the information you need to know. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It happens a lot of times that you don't need to know. Right. Yeah. And that's that's the point of it. A lot of a lot of elders do. They, you guys deal with a lot of issues that we just don't know about, and that's best for people not to know. Amen. Uh, and that's the way it should be. You know, we we know how people are. Uh, you know, it can take one thing, and it could be a false statement or accusation against the individual. But that false statement or accusation will still ruin the reputation right. of a preacher or of a fellow brother or an elder. Go ahead. Well, what might happen if, if the congregation all knew what the issue was? People start taking sides. Exactly right, yeah. And that, and that uh, promotes uh, division. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. And now, it sounds like in this study that we're getting way off in left field, but when we get back to verse 20, this will all circle around, I promise. But you guys are making really good remarks and stuff. It really helps. Is, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even the simplest little things, you know, I, I've had discussion, you know, with, with the elders here, and I didn't really make a big mistake or anything, but, you know, I could have, could have fixed it or done something different, but by their experience and by what Grundy's been through and what they've seen, they kind of approached at me and said, Brandon, did you think about looking at it in this way instead of that way? You know, it, those, those instances help as well. You know, we need to do that as well. And say, you know, maybe you shouldn't approach it this way, but maybe look at it this way and try it this way. And because of their experience and, and what they've been through, that I can say that's helped. Helped me personally. And, you know, it's not just about church discipline. It's about those little things like that as well, you know. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then it's not obligatory, it's obligated to pour that out to the church. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. But if it comes to that point where he does not hear and totally refuses, then it becomes an obligation to pour it out to the church. Right. It, 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 and the best way to do it in the 21st century, if, say, me and John, there's, a, there's an issue between us, and I go to John and talk to John about this issue, he don't want to repent. He don't feel like he needs to fix it. What I need to do, my two or three witnesses, they need to be an elder in the church. And, and take it to the elders. And, and Because the elders, they're, they're supposed to have wisdom. They're supposed to have experience with these. Why don't they go to the elders and the elders talk to everybody in St. John? 
Uh -huh. But and then he still refuses. Then it comes to the church. Is that what you're saying? So, according to this, according to verse seventeen, uh, verse se uh, seventeen. If he refuses to hear them, the, the two or more witnesses after verse 16, if they refuse to hear the elders. Uh, now, that's nothing, that's not practice. It, because it's hard. It's really, it's hard. People get upset. Because in our small community, our little churches, we have little cliques. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, so, uh, Brandon, out somewhere, uh, doing some terrible sin, uh, and I go to the elders and I say, I saw Brandon out there doing this bad thing. And uh, will you go take care of him? Mm. Don't tell me, no, you go take care of him. That's the way it's supposed to be, yes. Before, before any issue goes to the elders. And, and if anybody's listening, I'm, I'm trying to help the elders out here. You deal with it first before you call an elder. Amen. All right? Go, if, if the individual isn't going to listen, call, call the individual. Don't call... Don't call the elder. Don't call Roger at midnight while he's watching Beagle Dogs on YouTube <laughs> and ruin his his video time. Call it, fix, call it, fix the, do it with the individual first. I tell you, and and the Lord is going to be with us in that. We're going to talk about that. Where the two or three, there I am with you. Also, guess who's in the midst of those conversations in the discipline. The Lord Jesus is. Yeah. I, that's the whole point of verse 20. Uh -huh. I, and I know it sounds good when we take it out of context. It sounds like it fits. Like I can say, what, 40 people here? Well, there's not, there's not as many as we expect, but the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name. There, It sounds good that way, but it's not correct. That's right. Right? There's no doubt that the Lord Jesus is with us, whether there's... Only me in this building, and I've only, me and Glenn in this building, or a hundred in this building. The Lord Jesus is still with us. Amen. As far as I, I know, I don't feel like he's ever left me. Amen. So if a... Brandon doesn't sound like your ex. Study told and they're discussing the scriptures. And they agree one with the other. Yeah, yeah, but... The Lord's going to be with us no matter where we're at, what we do. That's right. That's right. And I don't have to be in a congregation. I can be at the home in my prayer closet and the Lord be with me. The whole point is, is we got to correctly quote the scripture, not misquote it. Does that make sense? Amen. Because if we say that we're the church of Christ and we believe book, chapter, verse of the Bible, then that means we have to correctly quote the scripture. Because when we start misquoting the scripture and believing, well, it, it applies just as the same as any other thing, what begins to happen? That's how denominations started. I, I promise you that's how denominations started. It, it's because of misinterpretation of the scriptures. And believe me, I know a lot of Baptists that are a lot stronger than a lot of Church of Christ. But when it comes down to it, they still misinterpret the Scripture. It doesn't matter how strong we think an individual is. If it's incorrect, it's incorrect. And that's just how it is. Um, so the whole point is, we're going to finish up here in just a little bit. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. The whole point is, is uh, having an individual to repent. Unlimited, there's unlimited forgiveness for those who repent. Okay? Now, you, you go to verse, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later on. I love this kind of study. I really appreciate you all who are, um, you know, have comments and, and things like that. I think that's really what makes a study like this, makes it, makes it so much better. Uh, Ephesians 4.32, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Here's the point. We're to put up with one another and strive in unity. We're to put up with one another. Um, Jesus says, going back to our text, verse 17. He says in the latter part, Let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. 
So the Gentile and tax collector, they were uh, people whom the good Jews would keep their distance from. The good Jews, the practicing, law-abiding Jews, they would keep their distance from the Gentiles and from the tax collectors and from the sinners. And so, but we know when Jesus did what he did, he accepted both the Gentiles and tax collectors in his kingdom. But we see here in verse 17, the last part of this, but if he refuses to even hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So the Jews knew how the tax collectors and heathens were, but they were saying, Jesus was saying, if there's a fellow Jew who does not, who is not going to repent, who is not going to abide in God's law, Jesus says, you know how you look at a tax collector? You know how you look down at a heathen and a sinner, you do that same thing to your fellow Jew because they haven't repented of their sin. Now that's, that's pretty hardcore to, to, that, to the Jewish community, to, to Judaism. Um, but, you know, we have to take note that the circle of people in the situation, it only becomes wider as the guilty party refuses to repent. If an unrepentant attitude remains, they are to be refused fellowship. They are to be disfellowship. If an unrepentant attitude remains. And um, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 8. We won't read it, but Paul it talks about disfellowshipping someone in the body of Christ. He said, deliver such a one over to Satan. That's some harsh words. But again, that's the last result. We don't go there first. That's the very last thing we do. And we shouldn't be excited about doing any. That's Listen, if I hope and pray in my ministry here at Grundy that the elders that I work with and we work together, that we don't ever have to come to a point where we have to disfellowship an individual. That's not a plea. That's like saying to your daughter or your son, get out of the house. I don't want nothing to do with you. Because you're, you're wrong. I'm, I, I don't have any children, but I, could, I, I can only imagine how painful that would feel to tell your child that. And you got you know, we're brothers and sisters. We've got to take care of each other. We've got to strive for unity. And, and hey, I expect each and every Christian, my brothers and sisters, to hold me at the same standard and accountability that I hold you at. Right. If there's something that I messed up on, I want you to come to me privately don't call someone on the phone and say, can you believe Brandon did that? Facebook. Or Facebook. Yeah, don't go straight to social media. I don't have a good name as it is, and I don't need any worse. But come to me privately and, and fix that, okay? Or anything. Yes, it would be shiny. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. You're fine. No, it's fine. You're good. Uh, that's uh, also kind of like if we have a civil issue with somebody, mm -hmm. we need to uh, settle it amongst the church and not in a court. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, um, and so, you know, this is what the Jews understood that a lot of us don't understand today, that you go to verse 18. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a different translation in the Greek. But the whole thing is, God has already set the rules in heaven. We here on earth are to follow and abide the commands of God. God's already set those commands. And we have the commands uh, in the scripture and whatever it may be. Um, you can, we're finishing up. You can go to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 6, and chapter 19, verse, 7, uh, 19, verse 15. These scriptures uh, also reflect to the whole context, going to the synagogue. Deuteronomy, the law of Moses, what Jesus is doing is he's, a, this is a direct quote from the law of Moses in Deuteronomy. That's where the whole two or three gathered in my name Two or three witnesses gathered in Jesus' name, gathered in, in the Lord's name to, to fix an issue. Um, is there any questions about where we've went? And, and is, 
does this make, let me first of all, does Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 make sense now? Amen. We're two or, go ahead. Yeah, let's look at it. Do, you're talking about Deuteronomy? No. Uh, oh, verse 19, I'm sorry. Okay, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by, by the uh, Father in heaven. Now, you go to verse 16. Verse 16, verse 19, Jesus is repeating himself. Verse 16 comes from Deuteronomy, the law of Moses. Jesus is going to quote the law. That's what he does. He... Anytime Jesus is quote, quotes the law, he establishes that law quotation two other times. Because when you say something three times, what does that do? It's supposed to get the point across, isn't it? It gets the point across. And so verse 19, again, I say to you, um, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. Now again, if you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, the context of verse 19 is what? It's talking about an issue, a concern about fixing an issue. And then verse 20, he repeats himself again. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Verse 20, verse 19 is a direct, direct quote from verse, uh, Matthew 18, 16. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 19, 15. He quotes the law of Moses. Does that make sense? I know that's a lot. I went through that really quick. Where it says there in verse 19 uh, that two or three uh, agree on something, mm -hmm. that uh, I believe is uh, referring to uh, coming to an uh, agreeable solution on an issue. Yeah, uh, reconciling the issue. That, that's what it is, reconciliation. And that's, that's the whole point of Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Reconciling the issue. Um, and if you go to verse 21, Jesus at, uh, Peter asked, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? What's Jesus say? Seven times, 70 times? But here's the thing. You go to Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 through 23. God, God's forgiveness and love is everlasting to everlasting. Um, Lamet it, is the Lord, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because of his compassions fail not. In verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It's all about, it's all about reconciling, forgiving, and repentance. That's right. Church discipline is not a pleasing thing. We should not get excited about church discipline. Right. Um, but it has to be done regardless. And so the question I want to finish here, we can ask how many times has God forgiven us? Many times. More than seven times 70. God's willing to forgive us every single day. God's forgiven us more than 70 times 7. Now, how often should we forgive the people around us who push our buttons, offend us, and just plain annoy us? And so, if I'm not willing on my part as a brother and sister, I can't forgive if I first can't fix the problem. You've got to fix the problem before you can forgive. Because if you don't fix the problem, guess what's still there? The problem is still there. That's right. And you'll always hang it over their head. Now, the, I'm, we're going to offer a hymn of invitation. We got an invitation, a uh, hymn of invitation. Um, before I give the plan of salvation, are there any questions about what we talked about tonight? Has this made sense? Amen. Yeah, Brother Greg? Many times with this fellowship and problems amongst, you know, anyone in the church family, mm -hmm. a lot of times they're trying to be the judge. Mm -hmm. We've got to let God and God's word be the judge. Exactly. You're right. Just like if I went to Rodney or Rod and said, I've done talk to this individual. Now it's time for you to do your job talk to them. That elder or the other creation or preacher or whoever I go to can't look at me and say, well, you're judging him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They gotta take God's word and say, when you're one hundred percent correct, we're going to talk. That kind of goes back to what we talked about last week, judge not lest you be judged. You hear that? We hear that I mean you even hear that in the church. And but yeah, you're right, Greg. God God does the the work. And our job, we're gonna offer him our job is not to weed out people. God's gonna do the weeding. Amen. 
Amen. Our job is to reconcile people back to the Lord God Amen. And, and to get people back faithful to the Word. That's our job. Let God do the weeding. He'll take care of that, okay? Any question, Barbara? Okay, uh, I'll get up with you after service and I'll help you with that, okay? okay. All right, so the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Listen, if we don't understand the sa salvation, then we're not going to understand how to get in Christ. Salvation is in the Word. It's not by any other way. Believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, repenting of your sins... If repentance takes place at salvation, repentance needs to take place uh, even in our lives, but also in the life of the church. So repentance. We've got to repent of our sins. We've got to confess Jesus as Lord. We've got to have our sins forgiven. Excuse me. We've got to have our sins forgiven. And that comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's, it's being washed in the blood. We talked about uh, typology in our tabernacle study, and that typology script, scripture about baptism. In 1 Peter, remember that, chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, the type and the anti-type, baptism is the anti-type. Baptism washes away the wickedness, the sin of man. And so you've got to have your wickedness washed away. You've got to be forgiven, and you've got to live the faithful life. If there's someone here that needs to obey that, we're going to offer in him of invitation. And, hey, if there's a brother or sister in Christ, someone who obeyed the gospel in times past, and you need to repent. You need to come forward and you need to get your life back on uh, where it needs to be. We're here. We want to help you. And we want to get, get you directed on the right path. That's called reconciliation. And we want to reconcile that path back to God. So we're going to offer this hymn of invitation. If everyone would please stand. We're going to sing this. <laughs> For a moment, I'm going to have Debbie uh, come for. What's your last name, Owens? Uh, this is Debbie Owens. Those of you that don't know Debbie, um, Debbie's one of our cleaning ladies. Uh, she takes part of the cleaning team, and uh, she's been here for longer, probably longer than I came to Grundy. But, anyways, um, Debbie had a heart attack not very long ago. How long ago was that, Debbie? Issue, but, yeah. Um, yeah, you had some main, main it, bad issues, and, and we remember that, and, and God has spared you life, and, and Debbie understands that. Roger's been talking with her, I, you know, I've been talking with her, and, and um, you know, Debbie is coming forward, and she said that she wants to come back to the Lord, and, and she wants to repent. She was immersed in Christ uh, at the Breaks Church of Christ. And so this is a sister, who, a prodigal sister, who, uh, who wants to come back to the Father. And so our job as her brothers and sisters is to help her reconcile. Amen. That's what we've talked about tonight. Amen. And so, Debbie, I asked you the question, and I'm going to ask you again um, so that you make that great confession uh, before the people. We've got to confess. Yes, absolutely. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Absolutely. Amen. She made the great confession. And, uh, and um, so what we expect of you as a reconciled sister, we want you to be here with us. And we know that you do. You've talked with the elders. Debbie is going to serve here as a servant 
of the Lord under the eldership of the Grundy Church of Christ. Amen. And that's what we are to do. We are to be part of a local body of Christ serving under the eldership. And, and Deb, Debbie's wanting to do that, but she's wanting to get back to the Lord. And, and, and that's so exciting. Amen. And we, we're going to um, pray for you. Um, is there anything that you want to say um, before we pray? The Lord has blessed me Amen. to be here to do this, and I'm not going to take it for granted. Well, we're, we're going to help you, and uh, you, you've seen some of, some of our love that we have for you and help, but we're going to help you here. Um, I'm going to ask Roger to do the honors. Roger was kind of really helped encourage Debbie and, uh, and, and pray uh, for Debbie in this situation. And after our prayer, you know, come and love on Debbie and, and help her. And we'll get your contact information, Debbie, so that we can call her and, and send her cards and, and be with her. Glad to have Debbie. Which I know where she lives at, so I can yeah. always pick on her. <laughs> yeah. So, Roger, you? I'm just going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we certainly thank you for this time to be here with Debbie and her uh, rededication back to the Lord. And Heavenly Father, we know that it's possible for all of us at some time to kind of drift away. We certainly thank you for this time, certainly thank you for this decision. And God, I just pray that each of us here as members of this local body will help Debbie in her walk. Mm -hmm. Just uh, pray, Heavenly Father, you'll guide us and give us wisdom as we do that. In Jesus' name, 